Hello and welcome. I first want to start by acknowledging the unceded territory of the Coast and Strait Salish peoples in which we are now gathered in this beautiful ceremonial hall at UVic. And I, I want to thank again Nick for welcoming us here and, uh, and just how important it is to me to recognize this tra traditional territory. I also want to thank the committee and my supervisor, Jason, Mijung, Rick, Peter, for coming all this way from across the pond, and Dr. Perlman, thank you for chairing today. I do want to also recognize you, Vic, and the Faculty of Graduate Studies and the Faculty of Education for their incredible support for over my career, PhD career. And with that, I do need to acknowledge the Social Sciences, Humanities, and Research Council, for which I have a doctoral fellowship. I also was part of a little team of researchers, the Transformative Inquiry Group, which I was able to test out some of my findings within a teaching setting, which was really exciting. And, uh, and thank you to Michelle Tanaka for bringing me in on that project. So, before I uh, really launch into the question that I asked and some of my methodology and findings, I have one more major group to thank, and that are those blue. Those are the participants that worked. And that was uh, National Geographic Explorer in Residence, Wade Davis, and his wife, Gail Percy, who took me to a place way up in northern British Columbia, Elu Lake, which is part of a large body of wa a watershed that's related to the Spatsizi Wilderness Plateau, where Wade was the first park ranger in the 1970s. May Sam, who we'll hopefully meet later, uh, a renowned Cowichan sweater knitter, and great-grandmother, and the elder in residence, one of the elders in residence here at UVic. She took me with four generations of her family back to Malahat, where she was born, and Cowichan Bay. And she was telling us stories, both to me and her whole family, about where she grew up and why it was so important to her. Iona Campagnolo, the former lieutenant governor of British Columbia, politician, radio host. She took me back to the North Pacific Cannery on the Skeena Slough, to the Nass Valley and the Nishka Lish Sims government building and also to Stewart, B.C. And I would hope that we can all just send our healing vibes over to Iona because she just suffered a major uh, accident and broke her back. She's currently in GS Strong. So if we can just send our healing vibes towards Iona. I think she would appreciate that. And she might even be watching right now on the live stream that's happening. So, Claudia Lee, the co-founder of the Hua Foundation and Shark Truth Project, which is, aims to engage Asian Canadians in talking about civic and social issues around the Vancouver area. Claudia, Claudia took me to Burnaby, BC, to a little postage stamp property where, with her grandma, her apo, she was growing tomato plants at five years old. And then to the public participants who took the risk to go online and pin their place on a map and then write about it or share videos or stories. And I have over 50 participants on this collaborative map um, and the website transformativeplaces.com. And let me just come back to this first slide. With the Truth and Reconciliation Commission hearings ending yesterday in Edmonton, the point of those commission, the, that commission was a, a process of healing, at least to start or to continue a process of healing, especially between non-Indigenous and Indigenous peoples. And I want to align myself as an ally of a process like that, or at least an ally of Indigenous and First Nations peoples around the world. And that's probably why we're standing here in this space today, or at least I'm standing. My wife and Otis are also standing. <laughs> Um, this space was built 
in, in, for an intentional reason, to gather people through ceremonies or celebrations or sharing. And part of the findings of my research is that sharing stories with family and community can affect transformation. And so part of being here is an intention to try and do that. And that transformation that I hope to do with my research is, context, is contextualized by what I think is this over-calendarized, scheduled, obsessive space, consumerist uh, community that we now are unfortunately uh, trying to manage. And so with that management, I think there comes a responsibility, not only to ourselves, but also to each other and to the earth around how we might live on earth, maybe a little better. And, and so there are sort of two more pieces on this slide. The, the first one is I want to thank you all for coming here to hear my shared story. And maybe you'll share some stories along the way and after the questions are done and that kind of stuff. I'd love that. And the other piece is I just want to remark on the intertextuality of these parentheses around re and trans. And the idea of re as a prefix is this is to acknowledge that we are never really un displaced from nature. We're all on Earth and we go flying around the sun. And even when we leave Earth, as Chris Hadfield has done, and many other astronauts, they require Earth systems to be out there. And so the re is really an acknowledgement more of the disconnection that might be emotional or spiritual, and I actually think even ecological, how we borrow from the future to be able to live now. And then the trans aspect, psychologists talk about formative places as being important. The trans piece is this idea that we, we're always going from one place into the next, and through that process we create a new space, the trans space, the third space, as some uh, call it. And so it's an acknowledgement of the complexity of that word as well. But, but as a way maybe to dive deeply into the concept of transformative places, I'm going to share with you a trailer that I use to recruit my public participants. So let's watch that. It's only a minute long. I remember me and my sister going down the beach and she says, Ikla, she says, let's go. And I said, ah, awa. Dad said, no. Dad told us to stay near the cabin. And my sister said, let's go. Big clams for Dad. And I think maybe these evening meetings here in this place, in that long ago time, was very influential in my later career and all that I undertook. Every blade of grass in that sort of 10, 15 block radius of, that had been my world as a child resonated with, with memory. Uh, shadows marked the ground where trees had fallen in my absence. It really taught me this kind of appreciation of life uh, because when I think back to that moment, I keep thinking of that word bliss. And you can only have bliss if you can really appreciate it so deeply from like your head to your toes. So I used this tag phrase, where would you go, to engage the public through the website transformativeplaces.com and maybe as a way to engage you in all this concept, I'm going to ask you now to Take the risk and be, and be guided through a visualization. So, if you could all, I'll invite you all to close your eyes. Now, emotions might show up here, and it's okay. If you need to take a break and go outside, uh, that would be totally fine. But pay attention to your breath for a moment with your eyes closed. And in your mind's eye, return to a transformative childhood or adolescent outdoor place. Now, the word transformative is intentionally neutral. 
you might have a positive experience, you might have had a positive experience or a negative experience, or more likely there are mixtures of positive and negative. And picture what is there. Are there plants, animals? What's the geography? Is it a rural or park setting, or is it a back alley, or even a tomato plant? Are there people in the picture? Are you in the picture, or are you taking the picture? And just stay with that space and think about how it makes you feel. Find a couple of words that might elicit your feelings. Like for me, for many of my transformative places, the word open comes which elicits all sorts of feelings. So find a word or a phrase and apply it to that picture. And just before you open your eyes, I want you to consider what that place has taught you or what it might continue to be teaching you. And you can open your eyes. So hold that visualization with you for the remainder of my talk and through the questions as a way to corroborate maybe some of my findings for yourself. And as I keep talking, I'll, I'll be explaining how the transformative places aspect was investigated. And maybe the first place to start is this, the question that I ask. Now, this question is informed by a bunch of disciplines. So the jargon in that regard is transdisciplinary. That I looked at environmental education, I looked at place-based education, eco-psychology, place attachment, uh, complexity theory, to try and uh, provide avenues for which I could ask this question, but also contextualize it in the larger sphere of, of uh, doing a PhD. And you can see that it's sort of multi-barrel, civic and emotional, physical, spiritual, engagement and connectedness. And you might also see my bias or my vision within this. I believed, before I even started this, that this existed. And so this bolded part is what I was most enticed about. Though, I needed to figure out a way that I might be able to answer this question. Does it actually affect us over the course of our lives? Well, it might not. But I wanted to investigate this such that I might be able to provide language to describe how it does that. And so I used a qualitative approach, which means that you don't do lots and lots of interviews in the thousands. You do a few very deep interviews in the social sciences space if you're using interviews. And the methods that I chose were based in about three stages. So the first stage was interviewing those four key respondents that, that I introduced at the beginning of this talk. And I used a, a squin, which is single question eliciting narrative or inducing narrative. And the squin was a pre-interview before we went back to a place. I asked each person to take me back to a transformative childhood or adolescent place. And and then when we got to that place, we did whatever they wanted. So we would do what they wanted to do to help tell their story of what, what transformed for them in that place. And to select the, these groups, or these people, I used a criterion recruitment, which means that I looked for people who were exemplary in their communities of practice. And all of that was filmed with the help of Matt Miles and Bill Weaver, who I'm extremely thankful for in terms of supporting the work that I did. They gifted all of their filmmaking time. And then I took these films and edited them, edited them in a bit of a different way than how you usually edit films. I did long cuts so that I could see all the nonverbal and the emotionality and the gaps and the pauses and the drops and the, and the moments that are part of how we tell stories but are usually left out when we transcribe text to text. 
And those were edited and then published on the website transformativeplaces.com, which I then asked the public, as I've indicated. And out of the public stories, I selected 10 as a way to crystallize those first four. And crystallize the findings that, I, that, I, that were coming up out of the first four. And so the findings uh, arose out of the phenomenological analysis approach. And that means that I was looking at the whole system. You can see that I was doing video and I wanted long edits. And I was trying to get a sense of the whole around how people were relating to place and what, what they were learning from those places. And then all of that was published in an iBook, which I've got a huge set of class iPads here that I'm going to be passing around after my talk that you can look at the iBook and see how it works. And it's all on mute so you can play videos and see stuff, but you won't hear it. So that, that, those were my methods. And then the findings, the findings showed up for me as memes. I was trying to maintain the whole. So I used this term meme, which was originally described as a cultural unit of transmission that evolves over time. And so memes, you can sort of think of them like themes, where I, I was able to cluster them. And so I found three clusters, place and family, place and connection, and place and transformation. But as I kept watching my videos, I realized that these clusters were sort of false. Because once you start looking at the whole, you start seeing how in each moment, a concept might be introduced, but on top of that concept was yet another concept. There were multiple memes occurring at one time. And those memes, therefore, were linked by these little dotted lines on this particular image. And so these are the 15 memes that I found throughout the course of my uh, examining my research. And I'm only going to talk about one for a moment. And that's the last one. Place engenders bliss and appreciation for life. So this came up in each of my four key participants in different ways. It wasn't always labeled bliss or appreciation for life, but the key element to bliss was relatedness. And the relatedness with a sense of ease when they returned to these places, or thought about these places, or considered the learning that showed up from these places. And the appreciation for life was, a, was a beyond just the self, the life of self, it was the life of family, and the life of community. And then also the life of the world. And the words that helped describe this were things like inspiration, celebration, love, joy, peace. And also embedded in bliss and appreciation for life was a sense of responsibility. This, this idea that we are responsible towards this understanding of bliss. So here's, I'm going to show you a little one and a half minute clip of Claudia talking about bliss. And then I have one more slide and then I'll be done. If I could think about this memory and, and what it taught me, I think it, it, I don't know, I just imagine, like, when I think about that memory, I feel like I'm open, you know? Um, I'm free of judgment, I'm free of judging others, uh, and I can just live as myself. And I think in that sense, it really taught me this kind of appreciation of life. Um, because when I think back to that moment, I keep thinking of that word bliss. And you can only have bliss if you can really appreciate it so deeply from like your head to your toes. Uh, and <clears throat> having that you know, moment of solitude and connection with my grandma and that, and they say out of all the senses that smell is one of the strongest and that memory that that was my first smell. Um, it's just this very intensely deep appreciation for life. Um, and, you know, and for me, that appreciation for life is not only with people from family, but with with the world around us and 
how strong a just a scent from a vine tomato can leave in my my mind and my heart I think that that is what it reminded me of and so just before this clip Claudia had returned to this place from her past from when she was five years old and had another meme show up, and that was the misremembering of a place. And probably many of you have experienced this, where you imagine a place being much larger than it is when you go back as an adult. And so she had gone back, and she thought she was going to see mountains over the top of the, the fence behind her. And that the backyard was this magical garden that was sunny always, and that there would be uh, tomato plants there even. But we went back, and there was a bunch of basketball hoops, and some grass, and there was no garden, and there was definitely no mountains. And so in that moment of being there, she was reorganizing her orientation to that memory. But also at the same time, this bubbling up of that memory is still valid, and the bliss that I was experiencing is still so important to me. And so through this whole interview, she ended up talking about uh, respect for elders and how she needs to be uh, paying more attention to how her elders her grandparents and her aunt, aunts um, are giving her, um, or transmitting cultural and uh, family knowledge to her and that she needs to be paying more attention to that. So that's part of the responsibility that she was seeing out of the bliss. So instead of writing a conclusion that was a synthesis of my... Uh, oh yeah, I forgot that Otis is on that. <laughs> um, a synthesis of my work, and trying to take all my memes and then further explain why they're so important to this world, I decided instead to think about how they could be important in an active way. How do you write a conclusion that's active? And that could be interpreted by a 15-year-old or government policy writer as a way to think about creating and sustaining transformative places. So, five principles, and I've got little cards that are somewhere around here that you can pick up and take away with the five principles. And I also have, I should say before I start those five principles, my findings, all those memes on these cards, and I'll hand those around as well with the iPad so you can sort of look a little deeper at all the memes. But the idea of the manifesto is to try and address this disconnection issue that I've been talking about, this disconnection with nature, whether it's emotional, spiritual, civic, uh, or environment, ecological. This was a way that I felt that I could do this. And so these aren't out of nowhere. It's not like I wrote this conclusion without considering my memes, because all of that influenced, I called it an outgrowth in my conclusion rather than a synthesis. It came out of all of that, all of those findings. So the first is I think humans are essentially outdoor people or organisms. Going outside is an essential human act. And that doesn't just mean to leave the door. We need to go outside and we need to do it well, in my opinion. So just saying go outside on things enough. We need to be present outside and to start breathing. And by taking that breath, we actually start to pay attention more to here and now instead of being distracted by all of the technology that I have brought today. but also by our scheduled lives. This idea that we're always thinking about the next meeting we're about to have. Sharing stories is where the responsibility starts to show up. So we need to share stories appropriately. When it's appropriate to share stories that, are, that we can share with each other, and through that, we might it might result in conservation. And it's not just the parks and protected areas conservation that I'm talking about. It's the cultural conservation, whether it's language retention or those family rituals that show up. These types of conservation are critical, I think, to uh, supporting transformative places, or at least the creation or sustain of, sustaining of them. So then the fourth continues on that. It's the how we might share, and that we need to do that through compassion, because our stories might be different with each other. But if we listen compassionately, and we also speak compassionately, we might change the way that we are oriented as a human race or as a society towards being more compassionate on Earth. And then the fifth one is to celebrate complexity. This is the ecological piece. We are so, I think, obsessed with simplicity and trying to maintain simplicity that we forget that there's beauty in the complex. 
And that we don't necessarily need to uh, be constantly thinking about every single piece, but we need to recognize that systems around us are all interacting and that we are part of that interaction. In fact, we have systems inside of us that are very complex. We have systems in between, from me to you, that are very complex. Community, complex. Ecology, very complex. And so once we do that, we recognize our relationship to that and our responsibility in that relationship, I think we will transcend ego and maybe start living as if the earth really matters. So that's my talk, but before I end, in each of the videos, each of the interviews I took, my participants talked about food in some way. And it didn't show up as a meme, but it's shown up today. And that, it was Claudia's tomatoes. So we have locally grown tomatoes. I've lost weight at some point into the Tultan summer camp, and I found them in the cook tent eating moose stew. Like crazy. So we've got some moose jerky and some other wild game. And then uh, Iona, who grew up in this fish plant where she packed fish into cans, we brought some salmon today. And then for May, when we were at Cowichan, one of her favorite berries was in fruit, and that was a thimbleberry. And it took Joy and I a long time to find thimbleberry jelly, but we did. And so we have thimbleberry jelly today to share with everyone. So uh, hopefully you can stick around and eat some food afterwards. And then there's some sodas as well for Phillips. So that's it. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you. So now we'll see.